I spent most of my youth in South London until well into my 30s at different houses. But it's a very vivid area. It's, uh, it's never dull, it's always changing. It has a tremendous vibrancy that very few parts of the country would understand. And yet there is an innate friendliness in the area that those people who live there understand very well. Can we turn left into Atlantic Road in a moment, please? I think I'd like to go down there and have a look. This is really the heart of Brixton. Once you come down the main road, turn left into the market. It's where Brixton takes its heart from. And everybody who lives in and around the area is familiar with Brixton Market and goes there and shops there. Can I have a pound of those tomatoes? Nice seeing you. We used to come in and buy kippers. Well, we still sell the kippers. I'll have some kippers. I'll have some kippers. When I was in my early teens, I used to occasionally erect a soapbox. I had two soapboxes, one that I used to erect in Brixton Market and the other in Brixton Road. And I used to talk about uh, political matters of the day and everyone was very tolerant. Some people used to listen, some used to engage in badinage. Lots of other people smiled cheerfully and moved on. But it was a very good experience. Very nice to see nice you. To see you. How do you do? It? You used to very come nice to my shop and had a shop recorded. The record shop used oh, to come to. Yes. yes. This is Cold Harbour Lane, all these old houses with the basements down there. And the Enterprise pub, which has been there for as long as I can recall. And here's East Lake Road, and that's the house we lived in for many years. Behind there in East Lake Road, we had a wicket uh, pitched on the wall of the houses opposite and used to play cricket up against it for hours on end. I think it's a fallacy for people to think uh, that because of my background and where I came from that I should be a socialist. Why should I be a socialist? It is people in the, that background who have actually suffered most from the fact that we've had a society in which the free enterprise system moved ahead and then was blocked as one moved over the years from conservative governments to socialist governments. When I was in my mid-teens, we moved to Burton Road. Where you see the house ahead with the two white arches immediately opposite there, that is where we lived. Is it still there? It is. It is. It's still there. It's still there. It's hardly changed. We lived in the downstairs flat. There was a, an area below ground and ground floor. And uh, I think there was a room or so on the first floor, but not the second. The second was occupied by other people. And it was a huge improvement on Cold Harbour Lane. It was a great step up. I was unemployed, and I remember vividly uh, what it was like to spend your mornings looking for a job, often vainly, and your afternoons wondering what would happen the next day. There is only one cure for unemployment. There's only one way to put people back in permanent, secure, sustainable jobs that they can be confident in. And that is to have the right economic framework to produce steady, sustainable, continuing growth in the economy. That takes time. It can be unpopular while you do it. It is difficult while you do it. It can't be done with short-term stimulations of the economy. It can only be done by bringing inflation down and keeping it down so that people know it won't move. The first ingredient has to be a competitive tax structure. Low taxes give people the opportunity to invest, to provide for their own family, and create a cycle of growth. You cannot lift yourself out of recession with high taxes. That perpetuates recession. Over there is St. Matthew's Church. That's where Norma and I were married in 1970. And beyond it is Lambeth Town Hall, where I was a councillor from 1968 onwards and uh, practically lived for three years. I wouldn't have missed the few years I was a Lambeth councillor for anything. It was one of the best learning schools in politics and I think in life as well that one could possibly have. You had almost every sort of problem to examine people with all sorts of ambitions, some of which could be realised, some of which couldn't. You had a population mix of a most extraordinary kind, a large number of people in very great difficulty often. Where do you 
all live locally? People are entitled to their own views, to their own instincts, to their own beliefs. And it is quite wrong to try and pigeonhole everybody into the same beliefs that the majority of people hold. Firstly, it cannot be done because individuality is there and it cannot be changed and you should not try and change it. But secondly, if you tried to do it, you'd have a very intolerant, very unpleasant, very autocratic society and not the sort of society I would wish to see. People are individuals, they have their own instincts, they have their own feelings. Uh, as a matter of privacy, that is a matter, I think, predominantly for them. I think every family has their own experiences of the NHS and will draw upon it. That's certainly true in my case. In their later years, both my parents were ill. They needed protracted medical treatment, both in hospital from time to time and also direct through their general practitioners. And they got it. Excellent treatment. Treatment that we couldn't possibly have provided for ourselves. And I saw then, at a young age and at very close quarters, the peace of mind that the availability of that treatment actually provided to my parents and to the rest of my family. I want to make sure that's there for everyone else. The Patients' Charter attempts to make sure that the excellent medical service is also provided as a personal service with the greatest possible dignity. I'm pretty clear in my mind what every parent wants for their own children. They want them as a basic to learn to read, to learn to write, to learn to add up, and to do that easily and readily as a matter of course. That is what we are determined to ensure is provided in the schools. And above all, that people have the sort of education that will prepare them for the changing world in which they're going to work for the rest of their lives. Nothing will be the same again. This world is becoming more competitive and changing at a more rapid rate than any before. In future, people won't leave school with uh, one career in mind, one qualification, and stay at that through the rest of their life. They'll need to be trained, they'll need to be retrained, and then perhaps retrained again. It will be a consistent learning process through life. And without those basics, people simply won't be equipped to undertake that changing learning process. The first time I came to the House of Commons as a Member of Parliament was in 1979. And I remember very clearly the excitement there was at that stage. Every time I go in it, I still get a thrill. Uh, I'm not remotely blasé about being part of the House of Commons. The atmosphere that it generates, the uh, authority that it has, the extent to which people turn to the House of Commons when there are really serious problems, and that atmosphere pervades the whole place. There are many advantages in politics. It's very exciting. It's very worthwhile. You may, if you're lucky, have the opportunity to do something that really matters. I think my background is an asset, not a, not a disadvantage. That's how I've always found it. I think the principal point about making policy is that it uh, is made up of two components. Firstly, intellectual conviction. You have to believe in what you're doing. But secondly, I think it is personal experience. If you've done something, or seen it, or been it, or felt it, then you can understand what it means, and you can understand how it affects other people in their own individual lives.